Welcome to Sweets and Treats of the Women's Suffrage Movement. My name is Heidi Herr and I'm a Special Collections Outreach Librarian at Johns Hopkins University and I will be talking to you a little bit today about the women's suffrage cookbooks we have in our collection. And joining me is sophomore Kristen Lee. In addition to being an amazing baker, Kristen also started her very own bakery called La Crumb Bakery. And the purpose of the bakery is to raise funds for Doctors Without Borders. She will be walking you through an adaptation of a 19th century cookie recipe. So you can bake along with her or just like watch in awe. And we also would like to encourage all of you to ask questions and we will be addressing your questions at the end of the presentation. So let's get started and let's dish. So what we're looking at at the moment is a collection, is a sample of the women's suffrage cookbooks we have in our collection. And these cookbooks uh, range from about 1890 to around 1918. And they were produced in both England and America. Unfortunately, these cookbooks were both um, undervalued and underappreciated for decades. So we are still learning quite a bit about their history and their context. And new discoveries seem to be made monthly. For instance, um, earlier in the year, um, someone unearthed a, a Los Angeles suffrage cookbook from 1910. And what's so fascinating and amazing about this particular cookbook is that it was written by members of an African-American suffrage cookbook that's associated with the NAACP. And this cookbook is helping us to kind of rewrite the history of these suffrage cookbooks. Well, there's a lot of things about these cookbooks that we don't know. There are a few things that we are aware of. For one thing, we know that these cookbooks were quite popular and that they were issued by several different local suffrage organizations across America and later in England. And we also know that these suffrage cookbooks were inspired by community cookbooks. And community cookbooks became quite the thing in late 19th century America, and they're still in existence today. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of the community cookbook, essentially it, it, they are kind of created by women who are associated with maybe a religious congregation or a civic organization. And they would contribute their own recipes to cookbooks that are meant to be fundraisers. And their names are often attached to the recipes. So you can kind of recreate various networks by looking at these cookbooks. And these suffrage cookbooks are no exception in that regard. And indeed, um, the fact that names are often associated with these recipes are crucial when you think about these cookbooks being a tool for advocacy. Cookbooks, and in particular the community cookbook, were a realm where women could write. It was deemed to be respectable. No, no one was gonna you know, fluff any feathers by contributing a recipe to a cookbook. And by kind of creating these suffrage cookbooks, you were kind of creating an environment where women who were maybe interested in suffrage, but maybe were scared to kind of ask about it, they could buy these cookbooks, look at them, and maybe realize that, oh, gee, my neighbor contributed a member, or, oh, um, you know, someone I attend church with uh, gave some recipes to this cookbook. It makes suffrage less scary and helps to kind of counter a lot of the negative conversations surrounding suffragists that was occurring at the time when these cookbooks were being launched. And rather interestingly, food was often an insult. It was used as an insult when talking about suffrage. The whole entire idea of like nourishment, cooking, domesticity, all of these things were being raised as reasons as to why women shouldn't vote. Those against women voting were very concerned that women would no longer take care of their families, that would no they would longer provide nourishing meals. And these suffrage cookbooks were actually very radical in that they were basically saying, look, we as women can do both. We can nourish families, we can be creative and write these amazing, amazing recipes while also being civically minded and engaged in the politics of our times. So just to kind of give you a sense of some of these like food-based insults that's kind of surrounded the world of suffrage at the late 19th and early 20th century, I'm gonna show you some postcards from our collection that really are indicative of what the suffragists were dealing with. 
So here's a comic postcard that shows, you know, the stereotypical spinster suffragist, right? She's very, very manly, very, you know, poorly dressed. And it just so happens that her name is Lemon. So again, you kind of think of this like sour, dowdy person. And the punchline, of course, is she is so busy partaking of the suffrage cause, you know, canvassing, doing everything she can to get women the right to vote, that she is going to be one lemon who was never squeezed. Oh boy, that's right, romance isn't for her. So this is one way that kind of like the symbolism regarding food was kind of lobbied against the suffragists. We also see kind of issues of like the gender politics of domesticity. And this was a big, big, big concern. So it's this idea that women would attend suffrage meetings or one day get the right to vote. Oh my goodness, right? And their husbands, the men in the family would then be expected to contribute to household management. So you'd often have these postcards that depict men being martyrs to the cause of suffrage. And by martyrs, it means they have to parent their children. You also have all these comic scenes that take place in the kitchen where men try to cook meals. And as you can see here, it often leads to mayhem and malarkey. You have toast being burnt. You have screaming children. You have a poor cat who's being scalded by hot tea. All sorts of terrible, strange things happen when women leave the kitchen and give control of that room to men. But wait, danger lurks even in the kitchen. So let's just say that you are married to a lady who has suffrage sympathies, but she doesn't attend suffrage meetings. Are you safe? No, no, you're not. Why? Because you might be conked in the head with a dough roller, a rolling pin, if you don't watch it. And the rolling pin in particular became one of the big anti-suffrage symbols. You see this all the time in political cartoons and of course in postcards. And as you can see in this one uh, postcard showing the two kids, children start out young, learning to terrorize men with household implements. You believe in women's suffrage, don't you? If you don't, you're gonna get bopped in the head with a rolling pin. So these images were comical, but they also underscored this truth, this real fear that people who were opposed to women's suffrage had, that gen stereotypical gender roles would be reversed, that no one would be thinking of the children, that families wouldn't be nourished. All of these concerns come into play when you look at kind of like food culture and popular culture and how they combined to kind of showcase anti-suffrage sentiment. However, the suffragists were keenly aware of all these things happening and they kind of decided to reclaim some of these symbols, thereby kind of showing that they had a sense of humor about themselves and that they were very aware of the arguments against women voting. So one of the things that ended up becoming a trend in suffrage circles was the suffragette dough roller. Unfortunately, we don't have one in our collection, but Heritage Auctions back in 2010 sold one. And the image you see here is from that 2010 auction. So apparently this was of course a trend, right? And this is actually quite clever and quite funny. You had suffragists kind of creating these novelty dough rollers and they were labeled with a slogan that said, we have had the big stick, you know, referencing President Roosevelt and his, uh, you know, slogan about speak softly, but carry a big stick, but they're applying it to suffrage. So it says, we have had the big stick, but now let's have the big rolling pin. And the other side of the label says, let's roll in women's suffrage. And apparently there's some evidence that women in suffrage parades would actually walk while kind of like carrying around and like displaying these suffrage dough rollers. So again, it just kind of shows that like the language of the kitchen, these tools, these symbols, they were a crucial part of the discourse surrounding women and the rights to vote. And we also too see a lot of, of these suffrage organizations really kind of taking advantage of this in terms of marketing. So we see uh, women's suffrage campaigns, for instance, creating things like novelty paper cups that would kind of showcase, you know, suffrage slogans of the day. And we have one of these paper cups for the 1915 Votes for Women campaign in New York State. And what's so great about it is that the water that you hold in the cup, it's meant to nourish the body. But then of course you add on to the symbolism, which is that water nourishes the body much like voting nourishes the soul. And then you also have a lot of businesses kind of jumping on the suffrage bandwagon. 
so we have, for instance, a trade card for something called the Women's Suffrage Stove Polish. Now, there's absolutely nothing at all in this advertisement that deals with why women should vote, aside from calling this particular stove polish the Women's Suffrage Stove Polish. But it's indicative of the fact that businesses were keenly aware that suffragists had money and they wanted to spend their money with businesses and organizations that share their values. And that's, again, something that we see today with how people choose to shop. And we do have kind of suffragists really kind of playing around thinking about the marketplace, especially in terms of food. And we do see suffragists, for instance, selling their own coffee and selling their own branded tea. So they were highly attuned with you know, kind of the food marketplace and the consumerism surrounding food production. And all of this noise, all this context contributed to the development of the very first women's suffrage cookbook. So current evidence suggests that the first suffrage cookbook was produced in Boston in 1886 as part of a kind of fundraising campaign for a suffrage festival and bazaar. And this basically sold incredibly well to the extent that four years later in 1890, they reissued the cookbook. That's the cookbook we have in our elections of the 1890s second edition. So while it's the second edition, all of the recipes, all the texts are exactly the same as the very first edition. And it is from this uh, Women's Suffrage Cookbook, the 1886 and 1890 editions, that we have our featured recipe for molasses cookies. And before I hand it over to Kristen, um, it should be noted that if you do try to recreate any of these recipes, you'll notice that recipe instructions are very different today than how they were in the past. You don't have information regarding serving size, regarding accurate measurements, and regarding the ingredients that you need. So if you do decide to recreate these things, you have to be like Kristen and be quite creative and very, very adaptable. And with that, Kristen, show us your cookies. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation, Heidi. I had no idea there was such a rich history behind these cookbooks. Um, so with that being said, today we're making molasses chocolate chip cookies. And we're going to start off with taking your sugar and combining it with the molasses. So I'm just dumping my sugar and molasses into my stand mixer. And then once you have everything in your stand mixer, what you want to do is you want to put it um, on a pretty low speed so that the sugar doesn't get everywhere, but you want to mix it until it becomes all homogenous. show a close up view. Um, it looks kind of like a very wet and dark brown sugar. And in essence, it, that is what you're making. Um, since a form of brown sugar is molasses and um, white cane sugar. So what you're going to do next is you're going to take your butter and the recipe um, that I created um, or adapted from uh, calls for a cup of butter. And what I did was I melted the butter so that I would mix more easily with the sugar and molasses. And so I'm going to pour in all of my melted butter. And once again, start on a low speed so that the butter doesn't splash everywhere. And I'm gonna mix it until it becomes all homogenous again. It, becomes, it takes on this kind of caramel-like color. This process takes about three minutes for the butter to combine very well with the sugar and molasses. And once you see that your butter is incorporating into the sugar mixture, you can start increasing the speed so that it mixes faster.
few things mixed together. I'm just gonna add in a splash of vanilla. And then my eggs. So this recipe calls for a full egg and one egg yolk. So. Use this bowl, egg whites in, egg whites and my yolks separated. And by adding just the egg yolk instead of the full egg, uh, the aim is to make a more, a richer uh, cookie dough. So two eggs in. And then I'm just going to mix it until everything's combined again before adding the dry ingredients. Okay. And here I have some all purpose flour and some baking soda. Um, you can use either baking soda or baking powder. It doesn't really make a difference in this recipe. Um, but if you are using baking powder, I would just triple the amount um, that you would use for baking soda. And so with the dry ingredients, I'm just going to pour it in into thirds and not all at once so that the flour doesn't get everywhere. Okay, and then as always, start with a low speed. You always want to make sure that you um, mix the dry ingredients just until they're combined, and you don't want to overmix as to overdevelop the gluten uh, in the flour and make it a chewy cookie. combined, you'll see that the cookie dough is a lighter color with everything mixed in. And then I'm just going to add in the two cups of chocolate chips. And then give everything a rough mix so that everything's well combined. I'm just going to scoop down the cookie dough on my paddle attachment. And because we use melted butter for this recipe, um, this cookie dough will need to be refrigerated for about 20 minutes, uh, 20 to 30 minutes um, in the fridge so that the butter can harden before you start to bake it. Um, so what I did was um, just finish this up. Um, so before this webinar, uh, what I did was I had already prepared uh, some cookie dough beforehand so that I could show you what it looks like 
um, once it's been refrigerated. But before it has been refrigerated, you see that it's a very soft dough. Soft dough. Um, and you'll see that it's pretty, like it'll drop off the spatula very easily. And so it won't hold its shape. So if you bake it as is, it'll be a very flat cookie. Um, and once again, that's because of the melted butter. So I'm gonna refrigerate this and then get the chilled dough uh, right now. And so with the chilled dough, what I like doing is using is to use an ice cream scoop. And right here, I just have my baking pan with my silicone mat so that I don't have to use parchment paper. So here's my chilled dough. I'll show you that it has a harder consistency. Okay. And here's my ice cream scoop. So I'll show you again with the spatula on how it hardens. And it's a pretty thick dough. So you'll see that it's pretty hard. Uh, this was refrigerated overnight, but 20 minutes is more than enough. Um, so what you want to do is just take the ice cream scoop and then scoop it so that it's hard, uh, so that you have a full scoop. And then you want to place about six on each silicone mat and then place it in the oven for eight to 10 minutes. Um, you want to check on your cookies about five minutes into the baking process to make sure that they're all baking evenly. If you notice that they aren't, what you want to do is take out the pan and then rotate it so that all your cookies bake evenly. Um, right now, I'm trying to scoop these, but because they've been refrigerated overnight and I didn't take them out earlier, um, they're pretty hard to scoop. So I'll just let them rest there for a bit. Um, but for me, if you want uh, really soft cookies, um, I'd recommend baking them for about seven to eight minutes. And then if you like cookies that are a little crispy around the edges and are on the harder side, then I'd recommend going for the full 10 minutes. Um, and so once they're done baking, you can take them out. And usually I have cookies um, resting on a cooling rack, um, but because these are so soft after baking, I recommend um, keeping them on the baking tray while they cool, which will take about another uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And once they have cooled, um, what I did was I went ahead and baked a batch last night to show you what they looked like when they were cool. Um, and so once they're cool, they will look like this. And oh, I'm so sorry. Um, before you start baking them, what you want to do is you want to sprinkle some sea salt onto each of the cookies and you want to be pretty generous with it so that the salt brings out the flavor of the molasses and the chocolate combined. And especially since we're using dark chocolate as well, you really want to bring out that flavor um, by using the sea salt. And I find that the best um, sea salt to use is molten sea salt, where there are huge um, salt crystals so that you can see the little flecks um, once you finish baking them. And so once you sprinkle that, again, bake eight to 10 minutes and you'll be done. And so once the cookies have cooled down, this is what they'll look like. And I'll take one and break it, and you'll see that it's pretty soft, even though they're baked overnight. You can see that they're still very chewy, um, and they're just crisp right around the edges. And I baked these for about nine minutes. So they're a little in between, between the kind of crispy edges and the soft center. Um, and so that's what they'll be like. And I think that these are best eaten right when they've finished cooling so that the chocolate is still warm and gooey um, in the center and then all the um, edges are cold. So that's the recipe um, that we adapted from the Women's Suffrage Cookbook. Oh my gosh, those cookies look so amazing. And I have to agree with the recipe that they make for very nice cookies. Do they taste as good as they look? They do. So if you want, you could bake this dough ahead of time and then refrigerate it um, and then even freeze it. But 
honestly, every time I make these, uh, we just finish the batch, the whole batch, um, as soon as they're straight out the oven. So um, I really highly recommend you give this a try at home. Um, it's pretty easy recipe, as you can see. It took about 10 minutes to combine everything together. Um, and it's pretty no fuss. So you definitely recommend it if you can. Thank you. And I actually decided to do a little bit of research on the originator of this particular recipe because I figured why not, right? One of the important things about these community-based cookbooks is that they provide us with a community, a network of women who put their efforts into a particular cause. And in this case, the cause being women's suffrage. And I actually found something incredible. I found out that it's not Ellie A. Hill, but rather her name is Ellie A. Hilt. So her name was misspelled in both editions of the Women's Suffrage Cookbook. And apparently this is a thing that happens to women in her family. Even her mother's maiden name is misspelled time and time again in official documents. But um, I decided to see exactly, I wanted to find out who exactly Ellie A. Hilt is. So I went into a bunch of genealogical databases and I found out some interesting information about her. So for one thing, she was born in 1852, which right off the bat is fascinating to me because the Seneca Falls Convention, you know, the big women's rights convention happened in 1848. So Ellie A. Hilt was really born into a society that was grappling with and dealing with issues surrounding women and their place in the political world. We also found out that she married someone named Charles Emerson Hilt in the 1870s in Natick, Massachusetts. And she lived her entire life in Natick, Massachusetts. And she died rather young in 1899 from sarcoma or, you know, basically from a type of cancer. And we see time and time again that her last name is misspelled, not just in suffrage cookbooks, but in census records, in marriage documents, you name it her name and her husband's last name are constantly misspelled. So it was a little bit tricky finding her in the historic record. But one of the things came quite clear about her is that she took women's suffrage very, very seriously. And her name would pop up in some of the um, like legislative records that are online for the state of Massachusetts. And it turns out that she was involved in a pretty prominent suffrage campaign. One of the things that women in Massachusetts tried to do because they figured out that getting full enfranchisement might be a bit difficult, they decided to start off small by endeavoring to get women the right to vote for school elections. And we see her name appear as a petitioner for this like school vote election campaign. But also one of the things that I found quite incredible is that she is given a shout out in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's official record of the history of women's suffrage. And this is a humongous six volume set that was written between 1881 and 1922. And it was meant to kind of document all of the ins and outs of the American women's suffrage campaign. And, you know, Cady Stanton and the other editors of the volumes gave, they talk about the work that Ellie A. Hilt did. It mentions that she's secretary of the state association, meaning that she was secretary of the Massachusetts State Association. And it talked about her efforts in a, a war effort. At the time, you know, America was involved in the Spanish-American War. And the, some of the suffrage campaigns kind of created, you know, care packages for the soldiers. And Ellie A. Hilt was one of the coordinators for the state of Massachusetts. And it's mentioned that she worked herself to death in the service. And though this is just a little blurb about her, it's interesting because we really get a sense of who she is as a woman. She was dedicated to the cause of women's enfranchisement and she continued to work despite her ill health. And that speaks a great deal to her personal strength and her loyalty to the cause. And I just love the fact that this kind of simple cookie recipe that Kristen so beautifully brought back to life is also bringing back to life this forgotten woman. I mean, she doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. So who knows, maybe one of you out there joining us will be inspired to do further research into the life and works of Ellie A. Hilt and give her a phenomenal Wikipedia page that pays tribute to her baking skills as well as her suffrage skills. I also want to um, briefly jump ahead across the pond a bit 
to talk a little bit about how suffrage cookbooks were kind of given their own identity in England. So history seems to indicate that suffrage cookbooks became a thing in England around 1912. And they did a couple of things rather differently from their American suffragist friends. So while they con continued in the tradition of the community cookbook, they did so with a sense of humor and a sense of business, business savvy. So one of the things they did was they issued their cookbook with several different covers. So you could kind of like choose the one that best fit in with your lifestyle. And these covers are very interesting. And we have two of these variant covers in our collection. One of them shows this idyllic scene of a boy and a girl underneath an apple tree with, you know, the girl holding a, you know, a little pie, the boy with a sword, but watch out, there's a dough roller. So who knows what type of mayhem will appear later on, I have no idea. But the other kind of cookbook is very interesting because it kind of like shows like the evolution of woman. You begin with like a young girl learning how to cook. She's at her mother's lap, looking at her mother, you know, making something to eat. And then you have this tremendous figure of Lady Justice. And then you have a woman like reading a book with a lamp of knowledge beside her. So this idea that, you know, motherhood, that womanhood, all the stuff that kind of makes you into the woman that you are, it starts as a child and you grow into it and you learn not just kind of skills that like nourish the body, but you also too learn about those things that nourish the spirit. You learn about issues of justice. You learn about what it is to be a good person and you learn about the characteristics that you need to develop to become a productive member of society. But you also do this with a little bit of a sense of humor. And so with these English suffrage cookbooks that you see a humor enter the scene. And you see this through the creation of a recipe for cooking and preserving a good suffrage speaker. So it kind of takes this recipe into being like a multi entree kind of thing, right? You have a first, second, third, fourth, and fifth course. And this is all about how to prepare a suffrage speaker so that she will be an absolute delight and super productive. And one of my favorites is the second course, which says to grease the dish by paying all the speaker's expenses. So you can see that's a sense of humor, but it's also too basically telling you how you should be treating these women who are coming to your town to agitate for the right to vote. And this like whimsy is also wedded to practicalities. So in addition to having these kind of jokey menus, you also have legitimate menus that are meant to nourish suffrage workers with this acknowledgement that these women are coming to town to campaign and they may be working as many as 12 hour days. And if they're coming to kind of support your work, you need to support them by ensuring that they are properly fed. So you really kind of see humor, you see practicality, and you see this idea that food nourishes your entire being. That's more than just what you consume. It is in a sense who you are. And this kind of sense of whimsy and practicality is then kind of transmitted back to America via the 1915 Women's Suffrage Cookbook that um, was produced in Pittsburgh. And this, is, uh, this kind of deviates from the norm few ways from the kind of the, the typical American women's suffrage cookbook. For one thing, it is very, for one thing, it is kind of very humorous, but also it's no longer a community cookbook. All of the recipes that are incorporated into the cookbook have been tested and they no longer kind of represent the diversity of the American suffragists in terms of what they want to contribute and the types of foods they wish to uh, kind of have you consume and that they wanted to represent. So I do want to show you just how these recipes look. You have things like a delicious nut cake that comes allegedly from an old English recipe from around 1600. You also have a recipe for Christmas cakes. So whereas recipe books today, they may have a particular chapter or section for holiday cooking, you don't get that in these early suffrage cookbooks. These sorts of recipes are kind of thrown in along with other desserts. So you really have to look for things that are kind of holiday-esque. And you can see with the Christmas cakes recipes, recipe, it gives you the list of ingredients, like the butter and the eggs and everything. It tells you to cream the butter to add sugar and all that, but it doesn't tell you if you're supposed to cook it, if you're supposed to refrigerate it, how many Christmas cakes are to be made, what these things are even supposed to look like. So they're kind of wacky, wacky and you really are left to your own devices to figure out what's going on. 
And I also just want to show you how this humor, how humor kind of comes into this one particular cookbook. And you see it with gingerbread. And one thing I have learned from looking at all of these suffrage cookbooks is that suffragists loved gingerbread. They were mad about gingerbread. All these cookbooks have multiple gingerbread recipes. It was a thing. And in this Pittsburgh 1915 suffrage cookbook, you have something that's called Parliament Gingerbread. And then you have in the side with apologies to the English suffragists. And this is some like, you know, left-leaning suffragette humor, right? Because of course, English suffragists hated parliament because parliament was, the, you know, denying them the right to vote. It was through parliament that all sorts of rules and laws are being enacted that ensured that the suffragists are being arrested, that kind of, that really kind of curtailed their liberties and their rights to protest. So it's kind of funny that they incorporated this recipe, but they had to include a snarky comment too. If you notice opposite the Parliament gingerbread, we have some griddle cakes. And what I love, again, this wasn't meant to be funny. It was meant to be practical. This particular recipe is very good for, you know, dyspedics. I'm sorry, for like sick people, right? And I just kind of love this, like, of course you would include this. Why not? If you're going to make griddle cakes, you're going to want to make sure you feed them to all the sick people that you know. It's very good for them. So you, some of these things are very humorous. Others, they become humorous through the march of time. And then you just have these things that are just bizarre and very kind of like woo-woo in this particular suffrage cookbook. So here we have a recipe for fondant, but again, it's for childhood fondant. So it's like, what do you need to do to give children a great childhood? So this particular fondant, you have to give kids an ounce of kindness and sunshine and pure food and recreation and rest and all that. And the woo-woo continues with something called hymen bread. Yes, hymen bread, meaning the marriage bread, right? And can you imagine you have this cookbook and all you want to do is make some cornbread. You go to the page with the cornbread recipe and what are you confronted with? But hymen bread. And you're like, what am I reading and why? So hymen bread, of course, you have old love and common sense and generosity, charity, and it's good for 365 days in the year. So you have these kind of little jokes throughout, which I think were meant to kind of make you think a little bit about your life. And what maybe some things that you need to do to improve yourself and to improve the lives of others. So while they're a little bit hokey and a little bit like woo wooey, I think they nonetheless were included in a spirit, not just of amusement, but in a spirit really of self-improvement, of helping women, you know, become better, more fulfilled individuals. And then we also have you know, how we saw in the past, how you had like suffrage tea and suffrage coffee, you now have the ideal suffrage cake. And this cookbook really was all about making angel cake into the official cake of the suffrage movement. So if you feel the need to make a suffrage angel cake, you can follow this particular recipe, which requires 11 eggs. And this recipe is, the instructions are relatively easy to follow. And it is by Miss Eliza Kennedy. And we actually have her name and her photograph which is kind of pretty cool to kind of get a feel for what this woman looked like and what her scene was. And she was a very kind of wealthy lady of Pittsburgh and she was highly active in the version. And she also was apparently like our very own Kristen, a phenomenal baker. And with that Kristen, do you have um, anything else you'd like to share regarding the cookies you've been baking or you good? Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad that I chose this recipe so that you found the history behind Miss Hilt. Um, I had no idea that we could find so much about her. Um, and I just chose this recipe since I used to bake uh, molasses chocolate chip cookies a lot when I was a kid. So that's really awesome that we found so much about her by chance. Well, I have to admit, I'm excited too, because I'm serious that we need to make a Wikipedia page about her. So I'm going to be spending some of winter break trying to figure out what else we can discover about her life and her legacy. And I'm also about to share something highly embarrassing with you. So I am not a great baker. I can make things that taste good, but look awful. For Thanksgiving, I decided to recreate a recipe from the 1915 Pittsburgh Women's Suffrage book. So I'm vegetarian. I was like, oh my gosh, these suffrage books all contain vegetarian recipes. And I was like so excited that this one had a nut turkey. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am doing this in honor of the commemoration of the passage of the 19th Amendment. 
I'm going to make the official suffrage nut turkey. And I kind of regret that I did. So um, this was my endeavor to make a mock vegetarian turkey. And yeah, it tasted about how it looked, um, you know, but I like to think it's kind of cute. And, you know, I just kind of dig the recipe because I love how it starts. Nut turkey for Thanksgiving instead of the national bird. Of course, why not? And like nuts were a big deal. And like all these like um, nut loaves, like nuts were basically what you had to eat as a vegetarian in the 19th and early 20th century. There was nothing else for you to eat but nuts and breadcrumbs. I will mention that while it tasted quite ghastly, it smelled so good. Um, it kind of reminded me of my childhood, right? Like um, my mom, she uh, was a stay-at-home mom and then she got a job. So I learned how to cook, but I learned to cook in a very kind of latchkey way. Basically Hungry Jack's mashed potatoes and like stovetop stuffing, like all these like industrial foods, I learned how to cook. And this nut turkey smells exactly like stovetop stuffing. So it was quite nostalgic indeed. But yes, this was my embarrassing attempt to recreate a recipe. And look, if I can do it, so can you, our Hopkins at Home audience. Don't be afraid. Don't make a nut turkey because it's kind of horrifying, but definitely try to make those beautiful molasses cookies. Um, I do want to mention that the uh, Washington Women's Cookbook from 1909 actually has something unique, and that is an actual Christmas dinner menu. So if you're thinking about maybe doing something splashy for New Year's Eve, since we all have to stay at home, um, if you have the time and inclination and you aren't afraid of getting gout, you could make this Christmas dinner that involves oysters and duck and chicken and cheese and ice cream and all sorts of kind of cholesterol explosions. And, you know, you can get a real feel for what these suffrage dinners were like. And it also gives you some lovely ideas for table displays. So, you know, that's something to kind of consider. And with that, um, votes for women, a very good happy new year and all that jazz. And we hope that this presentation has given you some cool information about the history of the women's suffrage movement, the important role that cookbooks played in agitating for the right to vote, and maybe just maybe has inspired you to recreate some recipes from the past, or at the very least, maybe you'll sit back tonight with a glass of wine and pretend to be a suffragist who just wants Santa to bring her the right to vote. And with that, um, we'd love to know if you have any questions for us about uh, the demo, about baking these cookies, or about the history of the suffrage cookbooks. So here we go. So here, Kristen, we have a couple of questions for you in terms of baking the cookies. Um, how much salt should um, I add to make one cup of unsalted butter, uh, one cup of salted butter? So if you only have unsalted butter, what do you need to do to salt the butter properly? Yeah, if you're using unsalted butter, um, I would just add a teaspoon of regular table salt um, to the cookie dough before you chill it. And then if you are using unsalted butter, also um, a tip you could do is you could brown the butter before adding it to your cookie dough so that it adds a very rich and nutty flavor in addition to the molasses as well. And what um, oven temperature did you use for baking the cookies? Yes, I baked it at 350 degrees and I'd recommend putting it at, um, not in the middle rack, um, but towards the top so that the heat from the top of the oven will hit your cookies um, and give them that crisp edge. And um, did you have any problems adapting the recipe? Like, were there anything that you had to like, sit down and really kind of think about or figure out? Yeah, so like Heidi said, um, and as you can see, the recipes, um, they're pretty general. They have a lot of leeway to them. And so when I was making these cookies, it was a lot of experimenting um, of what to do. And I had to remember back to when I was little uh, and baked this recipe. And I had to do a lot of trial and error um, of just figuring out what the right measurements were um, and what kind of butter, let's say, should I use um, room temperature butter or melted butter and what worked best. So a lot of trials uh, into creating this recipe uh, for today's webinar. And you had um, a lot of recipes to select from. What was it about 
this recipe that made you want to recreate it? Yeah, so when I was little, um, I found out about molasses and what it was, um, I think when I was in middle school. Um, and that was when I really started baking. And I thought molasses was so interesting because if any of you have ever worked with molasses before um, and like you open the jar, it smells kind of funny. It smells almost salty almost um, and kind of like soy sauce to me. Um, so I thought it was really interesting how it tasted so good in cookies and breads. Um, and so when Heidi shared the women's suffrage cookbooks with me um, and I was going through all the pages and I saw molasses cookies, it really brought me back to when I first started baking. Um, molasses was one of the key ingredients that I kept coming back to. So I thought I would give it a try again. Um, and so came up with these cookies. Uh, do you have any plans to recreate any of the other recipes? Yeah, I'm definitely going to check out the cookbook again and try and experiment with them. Um, as you can see, like Heidi showed you, there were so, so many interesting recipes. Um, and there's so much room for experimenting with them. And so I'd really love to give it another try. And we actually really encourage everyone, if you want, I mean, look, I shared that nut turkey with you. So, um, you know, if you would like to, we encourage everyone to kind of share the recipes if you choose to recreate them on social media, especially on our, our J2 Special Collections Instagram. We would love to see your, you know, your recreations. It'd be so cool. Oh, and we have another um, question for you, Kristen. Um, how did you choose Doctors Without Borders as the charity focus of your bakery? Yeah, so it's a pretty long story, but in short, um, so I came back home in March when COVID started hitting and I'm from Southern California. So we were one of the first um, kind of counties to be hit the hardest with COVID. And I noticed that a lot of my friends and family were working on the healthcare front lines. And so I just really had a heart for them seeing how they worked tirelessly every single day um, on the COVID front lines. And at the same time, I was baking a lot. And what I would do um, is I would bake a lot of banana bread um, during that trend, um, during that time, and I would deliver it to them. And so after much thought, I thought about starting a bakery, um, which I had been wanting to do for some time. Um, I saw that opportunity to do so. Um, I wanted to add that mission um, to really hone in on um, creating an impact that would be just bigger um, than what I can do with my friends and family and the people in my county um, and really support those on the COVID front lines uh, globally. So is the bakery something you will be uh, continuing um, once everything hopefully resolves itself with COVID? Yeah, I really hope so. Um, I'm hoping to return um, to Hopkins in the spring. And so with that being said, I hope to bring the Crum Bakery to Baltimore as well. Um, and I really see its future um, living in Baltimore. So fingers crossed, uh, I can bring this to Hopkins as soon as I can. I'm so excited to hear that. I will be like your number one fan. <laughs> this is, I know I have like an immense sweet tooth. So I'm like, I am here <laughs> for the Crum Bakery and for its positive and inspirational message. Okay, so we, also, we have another question that just came in. Um, where can we view more of the special collections related to the suffrage centennial? Well, we actually, um, this is pretty cool. So if you Google um, JHU special collections Flickr, F-L-I-C-K-R, you will um, see, you will come to our kind of Flickr account. And we have an entire album that showcases the ephemera that, we've, that we have acquired over the past few years surrounding the women's suffrage movement in both America and England. And we have been doing quite the diligent job of digitizing things as they come in. So you will have access to hundreds of postcards, pins and buttons, cookbooks, posters, you name it. All of these amazing, incredible materials that just tell such an important story regarding visual culture and social activism in the late 19th and early 20th century. And one of the things that we are trying to do is to make sure that you can download all the images so that you can use them for your research or just make use of them for fun. So that's pretty cool. Um, the other thing too that we do is if you go to www.library, 
www.jhu.edu. We have an Engage with Our Collections page. And from that page, you can download some suffrage cookbooks we created and some suffrage board games. And we also have a really great online ex exhibition that kind of walks you through all of the, um, like the history of women's suffrage postcards. And we'll be sure to kind of share all these links with you to make it easier for you to find them. But rest assured, we're doing what we can to make these materials available to the world at large. And another thing that we are working on is digitizing some of our unique women's suffrage cookbooks. Um, for instance, the uh, Washington Women's Cookbook that we have, and that's a cookbook that has a Christmas menu, along with a recipe for like roasting a dolphin, which I find fascinating. Um, it contains about 20 pages in the back that were blank. They are meant for, you know, an individual to kind of write down their own kind of tips and tricks and recipes for cooking. So it turns out that our particular Washington Women's Cookbook is filled to the gills with all these unique recipes that are written in different hands. So we're working on having that digitized. And once that's ready to go, we are gonna make that available to the public to download as a really kind of cool, crucial women's suffrage uh, resource. So we have a lot of materials and we're doing what we can to make them available to not just to kind of Hopkins, but indeed to the world because they're really important examples of our cultural heritage. And this is something that we um, hope in special collections to kind of continue to purchase. So even though we're coming to the end of the commemoration year, we really are kind of focusing on women's suffrage memorabilia. And in particular, we really want to find materials that kind of speak to women who have been forgotten. The contributions of women of color, of immigrant women, you name it. We really wanna make sure that the collection we build is reflective of the entire suffrage story. And unless we have other, any other questions for you, we're gonna wrap this up in a minute or two. And we wanna thank all of you for, the, for sharing you know, the holiday season with us. We hope you enjoyed the demo. We hope you enjoyed learning a bit about the history of the cookbooks. And if you are interested in learning more about what we have in special collections, I invite all of you to join us in February for our Love in the Libraries mini course. Uh, you will have you will learn about the history of Valentines. You will see some of these incredible and at times bizarre Valentines we have in special collections, some of them dating to the early 19th century. We also too will um, talk to you a little bit about the history of the love song, walking you through some wonderful exemplars in our Lester Levy collection of popular sheet music. And a member of our conservation team is gonna show you how to make these Elizabethan lock letters. So these were these very, intriguing letters, modes of correspondence that um, you could basically seal up and no one could read. And these were used for both matters of state and matters of the heart, quite hubba hubba indeed. So we are really excited about our February event and hope you will join us for it. And with that, again, thank you so much for your time. Happy holidays and happy baking.